Coming up on Tech News Today, China squashes Bitcoin a little bit, and also in China, iPhone coming to the biggest carrier in the world. Plus, can we connect all the chats? All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, December 5th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the internet the way it should be, anonymously and without oversight. For 20% off your new account, go to proxpn.com slash twit and use the code TNT. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT12. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. I'm Jason Howell. And we have assembled together today for one purpose, to bring you the top 10 stories of the day. Put them in some context for you, starting with the news feed. Microsoft General Counsel Brad Smith wrote a blog post saying Microsoft is, quote, taking steps to ensure governments use legal processes rather than technological brute force to access customer data as well as saying government snooping potentially constitutes an advanced persistent threat. In response, Microsoft will expand encryption across services, reinforce legal protections for customer data, and enhance code transparency so customers can reassure themselves that there are no backdoors. The Wall Street Journal reports that China Mobile has signed a deal to offer iPhones on its network. China Mobile is the world's largest mobile carrier with more than 700 million subscribers and is the last of China's three major carriers to offer the iPhone. The launch date is expected to coincide with a December 18th China Mobile conference in Guangzhou, where the carrier is supposed to reveal more information about its new 4G LTE network. The Chinese government is not a fan of Bitcoin and is telling Chinese banks to not view it as money. The government says that Bitcoin is a virtual commodity that does not share the legal status of a currency. The Chinese government also says that Bitcoin is at high risk for money laundering and can be a threat to financial stability. Security researchers at Trustwave's Spider Labs posted on Tuesday that the discovery of a database containing 1.58 million stolen usernames and passwords is associated with Facebook, Twitter, Google, Yahoo, and other accounts. The data seems to have been collected through the Pony botnet controller, which uses a keylogger to capture login data. 97% of the IP addresses associated with the credentials came from the Netherlands, though that may be due to a gateway or reverse proxy between infected machines. Starting this Sunday, AT&T is giving no contract full price paying customers better mobile share plan options that they've had previously. For example, instead of a sliding scale of monthly fees attached to the device, the fee is now $25 per month. For a single user, a standard two gigabyte plan would cost $80 a month or $20, $25 for the phone and 55 for the data. Are you following along? For contract customers, the monthly cost to add a smartphone to a plan goes to a flat rate of 40 from a previous sliding scale. So, a smartphone customer with a 300 megabyte plan would get a $10 break. Compared to T-Mobile or Sprint offers, though, when you crunch the numbers, it still isn't the best deal in town. Math is hard. Let's go shopping. Because uh, Acer just introduced the Acer Chromebook C720P. $300 gets you a touch-enabled notebook running Chrome OS. Inside, you'll find an Intel Celeron 1.4 gigahertz processor, 2 gigs of RAM, and a 32 gigabyte SSD. The Acer C720P is the second touch-enabled Chromebook on the market. The first is the Pixel, and that costs about a grand more. And the C720P is available for pre-order today. The Washington Post reports that the NSA logs location records of almost 5 billion phones each day, according to documents leaked by Edward Snowden. The agency has apparently collected 27 terabytes of location data, outpacing the agency's ability to analyze it. The paper said the system, called CoTraveler, analyzed the data and used a fraction of 1% of it in anti-terror work. However, even users of disposable phones or who switch a handset off after a brief use can still be tracked. 
Appwork, maker of popular J downloader software, is liable for code carried out by third party contributors, says a German court. Back in June, the software got in legal trouble over a specific feature that was present in an unofficial beta of J downloader 2, which enabled the downloading of RTMPE video streams on top of existing RTMP. And the Hamburg Regional Court decided that this represented a circumvention of effective technological measure under Section 95A of Germany's Copyright Act. And AppWork has been fined 250,000 euros. AppWork tells Torrent Freak the judgment is a burden on the open source creative process. Yeah, that makes things complicated for sure. Ford CEO Alan Mulally will not become the CEO of Microsoft, at least not in 2014. At least if you believe Ford board member Edsel Ford II, the great-grandson of founder Henry Ford. Bloomberg reports Edsel Ford said, Alan is staying through the end of 2014 and that's all I know while he was at the introduction of the new Mustang in Dearborn, Michigan. Microsoft said they plan to find a new CEO to succeed Steve Ballmer within a year. So if Mulally stays to 2014, he stays too long. If you've got an NVIDIA Shield, good news. Some users in Northern California are receiving the Grid Beta update today. The update allows Shield owners to stream PC games to their handhelds when they are away from home. NVIDIA says you need to have an internet connection of at least 10 megabits per second for good quality. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by a secret. A secret that you have between you, yourself, and whatever website you're connecting to, ProXPN keeps that secret for you. ProXPN is a virtual private network solution. I use it. I use it uh, especially when I'm traveling out and using Wi-Fi access points. You want to use them. You got to use them. Sometimes your phone that you can tether to or your access point, your little Wi-Fi thing doesn't work. And you need to use that coffee shop Wi-Fi or that hotel Wi-Fi. And you don't want anybody looking at it, whether you're worried about the government or your ISP or some guy at the coffee shop who's sniffing packets, use a VPN. It helps protect you against prying eyes, and it works with almost any internet connection, creating a secure encrypted tunnel through which all of your online data passes back and forth. Any online application can work with ProXPN, including your web browser, your email, your file sharing, your instant messaging. It's a 512-bit encryption tunnel. You can use it with OpenVPN or PPTP. You choose, and you protect yourself against internet filtering, filtering, against six strikes rules, against geographical restrictions, and most of all, prying eyes. ProXPN also works with your iOS or Android device, allowing you to use your data plan or your public corporate Wi-Fi with complete and total privacy. Works on Windows, works on Mac. It can be configured for Linux. And there's a new ProXPN app for Android in the Google Play Store that supports OpenVPN. World-class customer support, even security now. Steve Gibson gave it a great review. Go to ProXPN.com slash twit for more information and to sign up. ProXPN premium accounts are normally $9.95 a month or $74.95 for an entire year. We've got a special offer. Use the code TNT to receive 20% off for the lifetime of your account. That's less than 5 bucks a month on the yearly plan. If you're not satisfied, you can cancel within seven days for a full refund. So go to ProXPN.com slash twit. Sign up with the code TNT. We thank ProXPN for their support of Tech News Today. Laughing at Eternal Lazy in the chat room says, sniffing packets at the coffee shop. What, Splenda packets? No, not those kind of packets. <laughs> Don't do that. Packets. Yeah. Joining us now to discuss the stories of the day, it's good to have my co-host from Frame Rate, the host of NSFW show Scam School, and so much more, Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. I'm glad to be here. Are you not going to say hello to me? No, I, I said beautiful people. You said beautiful people, people you, you are, Tom. Yeah. You are one yeah. of the beautiful people. Always implied. <laughs> You're the most beautiful person, Tom. I well, not, kid, no, come I on. kid. All right. Fishing for compliments. Most beautiful person. Hey, let's make Sarah happy and start off talking about Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I was surprised uh, that you were so eager to take on this story, Tom. Well, I like China, too. So it's kind okay. of two great tastes wrapped up into one. Okay. Uh, first of all, Bitcoin not banned in China. You're going to see that headline everywhere because it's kind of ish true, but it's not true. Uh, what happened... There was a joint statement issued from the snappily, snappily titled People's Bank of China Ministry of Industry and Information Technology of China Banking Regulatory Commission, China Securities Regulatory Commission, China Insurance Regulatory Commission on the Prevention of Bitcoin Risk Notification. That was the name of the statement. Smooth it advises, like butter. Yeah, right? It advises financial institutions and payment institutions that they are not allowed to trade in Bitcoin as a currency. So it's kind of a ban on banks having deposits of bitcoins 
in essence, or, or Bitcoin at least is showing them on their their balance statements, treating them right, like like right, right, I mean, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they would have to be. They would have to have a separate business to deal with Bitcoin. They couldn't. They couldn't use it as a currency. Uh, they say it's a commodity. However, they uh, other than saying, hey, like anything else in China, you, you know, users should be registering. Uh, their real names and identity card numbers. We require that for social networks. We're going to require it for Bitcoin. And people are free to trade Bitcoins online as a commodity. Now, because of this, Bitcoin value in China, at least, has fallen. It's the first major government to warn against Bitcoin. The rest of the governments have been a little, little more uh, hands-off about it. But for China, this is actually a pretty tepid response because they're letting people use it. Don't you think, Brian? Well, First of all, this is like the inverse of the uh, legitimizing. Uh, when I was on This Week in Tech a week and a half ago, uh, there was a case where they had confiscated Bitcoins, where it's like, oh, so you have a government ent entity confiscating a thing. Well, it treats it as value as opposed to, you know, in-game currencies like Warcraft Gold or ISK from EVE Online. You know, those are, are flatly stated to be worthless. Like that, whatever happens in the black markets, you know, the, the people who provide them don't acknowledge that there's any value to them. And when a government confiscates them, it indicates there's a value. And in this case, you have uh, kind of the inverse where the government is saying, oh, yeah, no, they're worth something. They're a thing and you can have them. Just don't treat them like money, which is a very odd distinction to make. And I don't know. I can't tell if this is actually bad news or good news. Forget Bitcoin in the long term, because the mere fact that they're saying on the record that there's a value to it, but you have to treat it as a commodity kind of is a good thing for for the for the presence of bitcoin in the long term i mean i don't really see this being unique to china i can see the u.s saying something like this as well hey this is an unregulated currency yes you can trade it in for money but as long as there's not some sort of you know r regulatory body that's 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 making sure that uh the whole thing is makes a lot of sense and and all the good things that go along with 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 recognized currencies now this doesn't seem so crazy. I mean, the fact that it's China is, yeah, okay, I guess that kind of makes sense because the China government likes to have its uh, hands on a lot of stuff. But I can see this spreading to other countries easily. It's kind of that hands-on, hands-off kind of approach at the same time. Banks, you can't do this. Yeah. Everyone else, you're allowed to do this uh, at your own risk, this idea of understand what you're getting into kind of thing. Uh, because I think for a lot of people, it's still kind of hard to get their head around what exactly is going on with a virtual currency versus regular you know, currencies. So when it comes to China not exactly putting the hammer down and saying, look, nobody can use this, that I think is actually a, a bit strange. It's, it's actually uh, separating out normal people from banks. Uh, I would imagine, though, they probably would love to regulate this in the long run. And it's going to as long as these things are allowed to survive, regulatory things are going to have to happen at some point. Uh, Sarah makes a good point, as you make a good point as well. This could I did be not, done though. by the I missed the good point. I did not get Brian's a good point to those. Points. Wow. They were so good. I didn't well, even They were beautiful feel, yeah, points. Let's just Brian not talk about Brian's point. Self evident how awesome your points were, but uh, you're a beautiful person. What do I, you know, I, I, how, what can I say? <laughs> All right. Sarah's point about the fact that the U.S. could do this is a good point, but they haven't yet. I think that's what, what surprised me is the U.S. had a big meeting about this in the Senate, and they called it a currency, and they've been referring to it in a currency. And as Brian pointed out, they seized it as a currency. So China saying, being the first one to say this is a, isn't a currency, I think is remarkable. And I think it's interesting that you would expect China to just put the put the put down on this, just to block it all together. Like, we can't control it. We're not going to allow it. So, and that's where I agree with Ayaz. The fact that China is allowing this means that they know that this is worth having in their economy somehow. They're just being a little more cautious than other countries. And that's normal for China. They're always very cautious about how they let things impact their society. Well, and, and also in any kind of bureaucratic society, the, the first thing you need, need to do when anything's disruptive or new is, you know, either ban it or, or say no or say we need to investigate regulating it or whatever. So it's like this, this I mean, this is the logical in that environment uh, safest move for them to make, right? Is to say, fine, you can have it, you can do what you want. Just stop, don't call it money, don't list it on your balance sheet says currency. I would I would feel like the safest thing would be to say no Bitcoin allowed, right? Uh, but I oh, think what see, they but realize- then, But then I, I think you drive it underground and you create a right. black market and then then it does become disruptive. But for 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 China, that they don't care about that. They're like, sure, we have an underground Facebook community too. We don't care about that. I think they realize there's more value to Bitcoin than that. I, th I think you're right about that. Well, also going on in China is iPhone finally coming to China Mobile. Yeah, so says the Wall Street Journal. Uh, representatives from China Mobile and Apple both are not talking yet, but the Wall Street Journal says 
uh, and China Mobile, by the way, is it was the holdout, um, but also a, an important holdout in China because it is not just China's largest mobile carrier, but the world's largest mobile carrier by users with over 700 million subscribers, which is like seven times the subscriber base of, say, Verizon in the U.S. Uh, but yes, apparently the the part of the deal was is that Apple and China Mobile have been talking. There was there was uh, reports when the uh, 5S and the 5C came out that Apple uh, was was shipping units to China Mobile. So everyone thought, okay, well, there's a deal that's imminent. But it was hung up on the fact that China Mobile didn't offer 4G and Apple wanted some. Uh, um, guarantee of a certain amount of sales and China Mobile's like, ah, we don't really want to do that. We don't, we don't do stuff that way. But China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology has now given licenses to China Mobile and other carriers in China uh, uh, the go-ahead to operate in 4G. What's interesting is that so greater China, which includes big cities like Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, is Apple's third biggest market after the U.S. and Europe in terms of revenue. However, Samsung is by far the largest smartphone, provi smartphone provider in China, has about 21% market share if you look at the last third quarter of the year. Now, Mizuho Securities analyst Marvin Lowe says China Mobile has the country's wealthiest subscriber base. So the fact that most wealthy, well, the, the most amount of wealthy people were on China Mobile, you know, as, as far as overall subscribers, and nobody had access to iPhones is very interesting because iPhones aren't going to be cheap there. They're just certainly not going to, especially the new 5S. So he says, if at least 10% of China Mobile subscribers become iPhone customers, that's a, a huge amount of new signups, right? Research firm Trefus says China Mobile could sell, if things go well, 1.5 million iPhones per month over the next year, which would end up being about 20 million additional iPhone activations in 2014, which would represent a 17% increase in Apple's sales of handsets in you know next fiscal year. So that's a bunch of numbers, but basically the idea that the iPhones uh, come to China Mobile can be a huge, huge boost to Apple, especially around a time where growth is slowing in the US and some of their other key markets like the UK. Brian, do you think, do you think this is a done deal? Do you, do you think that the demand is going to be insane on China Mobile, or are, are they just used well, to other alternatives? I, I mean, that's that's my biggest question with this, right? Is uh, Apple pretty much defined the smartphone market when it came in with the iPhone, and of course, Android followed a very similar path. Uh, and the story here in the United States has always been about Android with its open. Uh, interface uh, slowly creeping up and then overtaking in aggregate the the Apple market. But now, I mean, it's a long time. We're what six years into Apple iPhones, and then finally they're coming to to this one particular. Now, granted, it's a very large carrier, but uh, but it's new there. This, this hasn't existed in a vacuum. These are all people who have presumably been using Androids and other other smartphones for a long time. I, I honest, I mean, obviously, I don't know the answer, but I'm very curious to see if coming in so late, six years late, would in any way affect what um, uh, what the demand would be on this. Yeah, initially, I thought the same thing as, as Brian when, when it comes to this idea that, okay, it's been years, Android's gotten really, really polished, Samsung's really knows what they're doing with it at this point, but that user base of 700 million people... Like, if you get 10%, that's 70 million. That's a ton of people. That's effectively a Verizon or a T-Mobile or Sprint. If the entire if the entirety of the user base shifted to the iPhone, they, that would be a huge thing in the United States. If it's just 10% of China Mobile, that would be huge numbers for Apple in the long run. And then they could have the... They would have the ability to have the upgrades and people get used to being in the iOS world, that lock-in that comes in with that, and that could grow out subscriber base as well when it comes to Apple numbers. But I just I think just that vast number and why Apple has taken so long to get to China Mobile is all of the things that China Mobile wanted from Apple and Apple not bending very well, finally giving in. And if they do get on this this giant network, a small share of that network would be substantial for Apple. And don't forget. We saw a similar situation play out with NTT Docomo in Japan, where they held out against the iPhone for a long time. They were the biggest carrier, and now that they carry the iPhone, the iPhone is dominating Japan, and NT Docomo's sales of phones have gone up. I'm not saying that that is destined to happen to China Mobile, but it, it's a similar situation in a, in a smaller market. So 
I, I, th I think, and, and I think Ayas makes the best point here. It's just such a huge carrier to begin with. Even if they get a, a fraction of it, suddenly they're selling a ton more iPhones than they have before. Ah, chat apps. We have so many of them, but where are your friends? Are they on WeChat or are they online or are they on Facebook or Snapchat? Isn't there a solution, I ask? There, there might be. Uh, it's called Layer. So Jeremy Miller, who invented XPMP, sorry, X, XMPP, otherwise known as Jabber, he's working with a, a new company called Layer. Now, uh, Miller's going to be a consultant there. Here's what Layer is promising. It's going to let any developer add messaging capabilities to their app with 10 lines of code. The developers don't have to build out infrastructure or any, any of that stuff. Any app that uses Layer can talk to other apps if the app creator allows it. So if you had something like... Let's just for, say for an example, and these aren't good. Uh, these aren't companies that are, talk, are talked about yet. Like if Instagram used Layer, and then if uh, Twitter used Layer, those people could talk to each other directly. But that's not that's not the, that's not actually happened yet. But that's the idea. Uh, the SDK is free, and it's going to be available next summer. Uh, sorry, the SDK is free, and next summer's Layer is going to open source all of its stuff. Uh, how does Layer make money? If you're thinking, okay, they're going to do this altruistic thing, and nothing's going to happen. Layer says it's going to charge developers once they reach a certain number of users. So like a lot of other web services, uh, but it hasn't set the prices yet. And they've got some sizable people. I mentioned Jeremy Miller. Uh, they've got people from uh, Grand Central, which was bought and turned into Google Voice. Uh, Vox IO, which let you make calls on a browser without plugins. And it's backed by Jerry Yang. You might know him as the co-founder of Yahoo. Sure, do, we, do you think we're going to see a, a new crop of interconnected apps that can actually talk to each other? Or are we going to continue to see these walled gardens like iMessage and WhatsApp? I, uh, unfortunately, there's not much of a reason. I mean, first of all, obviously, the reasons people would want to do this is that it's easy. You you get to tout your functionality. But my guess is is that you you have essentially some kind of like real ID associated with each of these. Because if it has to, if it can find you on any platform, I, I don't know how excited consumers are going to be about that. Because if what you want to do is be found, then you would run a service that would that could find you. And I personally. Uh, weirdly, being on PC only, I find, you know, I use iMessage a lot on my iPhone, but I wish that there was a, a, a universal, I miss the days of MSN Messenger, I guess is what I'm saying, where because I knew it was on every freaking PC out there, we could we could use it. Now I don't, I don't use it at all. So I don't know as a consumer what I, whether I want this, and I don't know for the providers how much of a need there is for it. I mean, How's that it, for an evasion? It, it kind of reminds me of, you know, when I used to use Trillion, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah. ah, you know, you just sort of like, who cares who's using Yahoo Messenger or AIM or, you know, that sort of thing. In fact, I mean, it's still sort of the case when I'm using iMessage. I've got people who are using their uh, Gchat and, and, and AIM as well. And, and it's like, it doesn't really matter as long as I can communicate somebody what, how, how it works. Something like this uh, for a user, I think, is great. In fact, I was just talking to Ron Richards of All About Android last night, and he's like, oh, I use WeChat with one of my nieces because it's a free thing and you don't have to worry about, I don't know, whatever. This is some compatibility thing. And I was like, oh, yeah, WeChat, I forgot about that. And then there's WhatsApp, and then there's iMessage, and there's this and that. So it's like, right now, if everybody can talk to other apps, that's great for a consumer, but then it makes all of these different messaging solutions seem like basically the same thing. The only, the only thing that they all have going for them, right, is, uh, you know, WhatsApp has all these subscribers that use WhatsApp now and don't use something like iMessage or WeChat. Why? I don't know, because it's trendy. But if it just is basically the same service with maybe different colors and a different logo, then how, how is it going to stand out as a, you know, a market leader? Well, and the instant messaging services never saw the motivation to standardize. Gmail's Gtalk or, or Hangouts or whatever they're calling it these days was Jabber compliant when it launched. We used Jabber in the Tech TV chat room when we relaunched it so that you could plug into it with anything. Jabber had great promise to unify instant messaging, and they even got Google on their side, and they couldn't unify instant messaging. We still don't have unified instant messaging. I don't see how that's going to change because the motivations that Sarah just described for those apps that are out there is the same motivations instant messaging have had, and it's why most of them didn't want to unify. See, I don't see this just being 
a bunch of new messaging cha- apps coming out. I'd imagine this to be in, in games. It'd be in other, like maybe productivity apps, lots of different other, like maybe even Flipboard or something like that. If you have these applications that can talk to each other, if you want a quick way to actually message people, because uh, we've seen how messaging has become important or like as a secondary tier to a lot of things that report that Instagram might add, add messaging is why I mentioned that as, a, as, a, as an idea, is be, if you have a standard that you, if somebody doesn't have to even think about where, if I could, if I could write from words with friends and I can write to somebody who is using Flipboard, which sounds weird, but that, that kind of layer of interoperability would be amazing if it works. And that's why they call it a layer, obviously. Uh, well, but- and that's, the, and that's the weird part is I suspect that most people don't want that. Like just now you were describing a scenario that to me was like, Ugh, I don't want you to be able to message me from words where they know where I can go. It's always popping up. Like I already have to pretend like I'm not there when I'm on Gmail and get a G chat thing popping up from someone I don't want to talk to. Is that why you never return my messages, Brian? It, well, specifically this morning. That and the fact I was still asleep. <laughs> you sleep chat. Come on. <laughs> sleep chat is also going to be using Layer for its own messaging. Yeah. All right. Let's take a quick break. Thank our sponsor, Gazelle. Uh, you're probably thinking about getting a new iPad, maybe a new phone. Maybe you're hoping to get one as a holiday gift. Uh, you're going to want to get that old gadget, turn it into cash. You got an old tablet lying around. You got an old iPhone, an old iPad you're about to replace, go to gazelle.com. Do yourself a favor. It's G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Find your item. Tell Gazelle the condition. They'll even buy broken iPhones and iPads. Get a risk-free offer for your gadgets and free shipping. Then you've got 30 days to send them the gadget. That's right. You lock in the price. It's still good for 30 days. It's no risk. There's no reason you shouldn't just go lock in a price right now for 30 days. When you send them the device, you'll get paid fast by check, PayPal, or get an extra 5% with an Amazon gift card. So do it now. Find out what your iPhone is worth. Take a minute and go to gazelle.com to find out. Do it now because your iPhone may lose value the longer you wait. Get some cash for the holidays at gazelle.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Interesting story on Ars Technica. John Brodkin uh, has it. Federal Communications Commission Chairman Tom Wheeler while answering questions Monday after a policy speech at The Ohio State University, uh, said the following. Jason, do we have it? Um, I think we're also going to see a two-sided market where Netflix might say, well, I'll pay in order to make sure that, um, that you, Mike, receive, my subscriber receive the best possible uh, transmission of, of this movie. Um, I think we want to let those kinds of things evolve, and we want to observe what happens from that, and we want to make decisions accordingly. But I go back to the fact that the marketplace is where these decisions ought to be made, and that the functionality of a competitive marketplace dictates the degree of regulation. Now, if you go back earlier in that, in fact, right before he answers that question, he talks about the Open Internet Initiative and how he believes it's the right thing for the FCC to do. The Open Internet guidance from the FCC uh, says, as a general matter, it is unlikely that pay for priority would satisfy the no unreasonable discrimination standard. So in his next question, if you missed it at the end, he says, I think we're also going to see a two-sided market where Netflix might say, well, I'll pay in order to make sure that you might receive my, my subscriber receives the best possible transmission. That sounds to me like pay for priority. Now, he goes on to talk about competition. The other part of this that he doesn't address is we don't have a lot of competition on the consumer side with the ISP subscription. So, Brian, sounds good. Let the marketplace decide. Uh, but what do you think about what Wheeler's saying? Well, first of all, markets are inherently ugly and hideous. At least with uh, with regulation, you have the fantasy of believing that you're going to know the outcome in advance. and You're going to state out loud, Netflix will always be super cheap and good and free. And everyone cheers. You know, you say something like this, like Netflix may or may not continue to be cheap as we negotiate deals in the background that may or may not traffic shape in the future. Uh, none of that is anything as a consumer that I want to be excited about. But it's a case of do you believe in the process? And I, I think I do believe in the process and I'm not I'm not I'm not thrilled about it. It's not going to be fun to sit here and wonder if they're going to screw up one of the best ways to watch movies in my lifetime. But I got to believe that uh, that they're the experts. They know. There and you know Netflix. What we had a story on frame rate about Netflix was like I don't know, like twenty percent of all bandwidth or something ridiculous. 
Uh, but uh, if that's the case, it then... It was more, yeah. But yeah. yeah. I mean, I got to I gotta believe that they'll... Yeah, I, I, I believe in the system, Tom. <laughs> but which system? I guess that's the question, right? Ayaz, what do you think of this? I think Wheeler might... I, I'm trying to make sense of this. Why anybody would say those two things anywhere near each other. But maybe he's just a realist. He's saying, this is what we want to do the FCC. We want to make sure there's open things. He goes, but yeah, I could see a market where this develops. Because that's what the market's done, right? Would, would you imagine... The market having something efficient, like selling you a channel, a network by itself, or would they be bundled and tied together and you have to get this special sports package for this extra channel? Like all these ridiculous things that have come out of the market. So maybe he's thinking of it longer term. And as a realist, he's just like, yeah, it could happen. But he doesn't sound like he's excited about the idea, nor does he sound like he's he hates the idea. It just sounds very monotone when it comes to that. But uh I really, I, I, could, I could see a market where that happens. I mean, we've, we've talked about Netflix talking to places like Comcast where they want to have Netflix as an app on the set-top box and they want to be able to have some of their movies like cached at these ISPs so they don't have to worry about uh, quality of service. So these kinds of deals have been talked about, but who knows if, whether it's going to happen if the FCC actually regulates it. That's a whole other thing. But what will the market do without regulation? S screw the customer, usually? <laughs> I, 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 I did not listen to the entire interview here, so maybe I'm missing something that he said. I want to hear Wheeler talk about what he is going to do to make sure that competition that he mentions happens. Because I will buy everything he says here if that last part about functionality of a competitive marketplace existed. But on the consumer ISP side, we don't have that right now. We do not have right. a functional competitive marketplace, and that is the key to all of this. So let's, you know, let's not put the cart before the horse or some other metaphor. Let's fix the problem, which is we don't have choices or at least enough choices to make a difference when we choose our Internet service. That's what I want to hear Tom Wheeler talk about. Yeah, you hear that, Tom? Tom to Tom. Mr. Tom Wheeler, as a fellow Tom, I implore you, talking <laughs> about the competition. Uh, you know, the, just, just, just to give a little spin to this, the other side, he could be talking about content delivery networks, not consumer ISPs, when he says Netflix paying for insurance of delivery. Well, and, that's, uh, and we've that's covered that thing. Sort of thing. You know, right now, uh, I, and I, I figured that you would have more insight on it because you're the one who explained to me the way peering works and the way uh, mm -hmm. traffic you know, prioritization happens. Uh, if they shape it into something where Netflix is purchasing a product, that gives them tremendous leverage. Netflix is doing very well. They're making a lot of money. Keep in mind, for the consumer, all this may mean is that Netflix is now paying for its own space on all of these servers, which would give them extraordinary leverage to demand certain levels of quality, quality of service. Maybe this is what, this is the type of negotiations that could allow everyone to get a 4k stream over netflix and so in that regard you know it's a two-way street you know no we don't want to see extra fees slowing everything down but on the flip side you get a thing when you pay for it you get the priority and the ability to demand certain levels of response let's not leave the regulation topic yet uh, sarah the u.s wants uh, online ads to get better yeah, so there's a survey of online publishers uh, that found, recent survey, that found about 73% 73, 73 allowed something called native advertising. Those are the sorts of things, let's say you look at a BuzzFeed article and it's like, the cutest pictures of kittens in the month of October, sponsored by Purina. So it's sort of like, okay, it's not necessarily deceptive, but there's an agenda there, and it's baked in nicely. Marketers have gotten uh, smarter than just saying, ah, oh, let's put a banner ad for something on a page that, you know, that Sarah will never look at. And she's gotten really good at ignoring. So it's basically baked in. So native advertising is the term for this. Uh, FCC chairwoman Edith Ramirez said in a speech uh, at a conference called Blurred Lines Advertising or Content, Quote, marketers have moved past the banner ad into advertising that's more seamlessly and inconspicuously integrated into digital content. While native advertising may bring some benefits to consumers, it has to be done lawfully by presenting ads that resemble editorial content and advertiser risks implying deceptively that the information comes from a non-biased source. Now, the FTC is not saying okay, you can't have native advertising anymore. That's that's not what's going on. It's, it's basically just saying, we understand that this is a potential issue and lines could be blurred and we don't want that to happen to consumers. You might remember back in 2009, the FTC issued guidelines making bloggers who endorsed products, uh, force them to say whether they were being financially compensated or not, which, you know, a lot of bloggers were like, oh my God, that's crazy, it's changing everything. But 
in many ways, you could argue that that's really good for the person who's reading the article. Is the is the person who's 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 uh, talking about this wonderful spoon here somehow getting a kickback? And I should know that before I make an informed decision as a consumer. Brian, do you find do you find native advertising ever confusing you? Do you think that it has the potential to be regulated? Uh, well, that's the problem, right? Is if you regulate it, essentially what you do is you just get everyone to be freaking weasels and figure out some way around it. I mean, obviously that 2009 FTC ruling, you know, that, that you have to disclose everything, that, that changed nothing, that fixed nothing. Essentially what they tried to do was, was enforce credibility on people who didn't deserve a reputation for being credible. If uh, that's the way it happens, if somebody's always shilling for a thing and the, and the product's always crap and you then you don't believe him. And then the marketplace of ideas says you're just an ad man and you're always shouting spam. I'm going to unfollow you. I'm done with this. Uh, it, but when you try to say, no, everyone disclose. So now we all have credibility, right? No, you still don't. It, it changes absolutely nothing. In the marketplace of ideas, you win and lose and die by your own reputation and you can't enforce a reputation on any site. You know, I, I don't even go to BuzzFeed anymore because it's always these clickbait uh, headlines. And we're already seeing the backslash, the backlash against it. Um, uh, during a, a Baratunde's uh, comedy hack event, they had somebody put together a, a website called Clicksterbait that, uh, 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 I forget how it's spelled in some stupid Web 2.0 way. But when you go, it just auto-generated an entire page of all those clickbait uh, ads with, uh, you know, with random clip art in there. Uh, we are becoming wise to this. The answer is for the public to become nuanced and to understand the re the real waters they're swimming in, not for any government entity to come in and say, everyone has to be respectable and honest now. And now you can trust everyone because we said that. You know, the public, though, already has they kind of learned this with magazines, right? When you go through a magazine, these advertising uh, schemes or these these pages have turned a lot more like advertorials they'll have. There's a special section or something silly to say. This is not part of the magazine. So this isn't new by any means. It's just it's online and it could look more native because they can maybe they can dock to the CSS so it looks exactly the same. But these things have been labeled and, and Brian's right. If you're going to have a web page and you want to be reputable, it's really stupid to have certain kinds of ads on your site if you want people to keep coming back there. So uh, whether they label it or not, I think you know labeling things on search engines like Google, that makes sense when you have a sponsored thing there instead of it being, uh, a naturally generated thing you're looking for versus looking for editorial content. It might just be the magazine thing where we'll just see the same two words, sponsored post, and it's like, oh, that's fascinating. It's just whether you're going to click it or not. Right. All right, let's uh, finish up our roundtable discussion with Twitter and Deutsche Telekom getting in virtual bed together. Yes, a virtual home screen of sorts. Yeah, so uh, Twitter signed a deal with Deutsche Telekom, and uh, Twitter's going to create a unique experience for the telecom and Android phones will come preloaded with a Twitter widget on their home screen starting next year. Uh, this is going to first roll out in Germany, then hit Netherlands, Romania, Greece, and Croatia. Deutsche Telekom says it will get early access to new tools and innovations on the technical side, whatever that means. Sure, this sounds like a good idea for Twitter, right? You got a, you got a, a widget on the home screen of these Android devices starting next year, but can Twitter's branding help Deutsche Telekom or even T-Mobile? I mean, I guess we'll find out. Look, this is this goes right back to the. I mean, to be honest, this is an extension of what we just talked about. Like, it's uh, it, it, maybe it's a terrible idea, but that's why you need freedom is to do terrible ideas. And uh, maybe this is something that nobody's going to care about. Uh, this is I, I I literally have no opinion about this whatsoever. Outside of I, I do think it's interesting to see Twitter so publicly going outside of their core um, competencies and what they're known for to do something like this. It is an interesting way to look at Twitter's monetization strategy. Uh, we've all wondered how else is Twitter going to make money other than a few advertising posts and promoted tweets. I don't see a need for it. I, I kind of feel like Brian, I guess. I, I just don't have an opinion about this. I am not going to buy a phone because it has it. I probably would just turn it off if I had a phone that did have it. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it would just be this magical thing that would make me love my phone. Uh, I do not like exclusive rollouts of functionality like this because to me, the brand proposition of Twitter is it works like Twitter no matter where you use it, right? And as they have continued to close down their API against certain things, Twitter has worked less like Twitter no matter where you use it. And this is even less like Twitter. It's like, oh, you have to be in one of these countries in Europe to get this feature of it. The fact that it's a feature I don't care about means I'm not upset about it. But if it was a feature I cared about, maybe I would. If it's not a feature I care about it, is it really a good deal for Deutsche Telekom? 
the other thing is like you can do this yourself with a widget. Obviously, a lot of people can do that. If you use an iOS device, you pull down from the top, and it's got a tweet function there if you want that as well. So whether it's going to bring a lot of users to Twitter, I don't even know. It might just be seen as bloatware or something that might irritate people. So I'm not even sure if this is a smart move for Twitter. Other than seeing this thing there all the time and maybe getting a stream or you're signing in or you're uh, if, if, as long as the widget itself is not a battery drain, drain or it's causing other issues. Like, remember Moto Blur, the original one where basically it had all of your friend status everywhere, but it killed battery life. It was hideously uh, designed, and it just didn't work very well. If Twitter can have a decent widget that can somehow entice people to use it, I don't know how that's going to happen unless you're already a Twitter user. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's like... We're going to have some weird, unique experience for certain users. That's, it goes against everything that Twitter wants. Twitter wants something that's pretty universal, right? They don't really want third-party apps to be making Twitter look different or act differently. Many of those have gone away or, you know, have had their APIs yanked or, or, or changed in a way that, that is not conducive. Uh, the mobile app and the, the, the web version of Twitter more and more look and act like each other. Why do you want something that's very specific to just a certain group of people that are on a certain carrier? It's odd to me. Well, again, like, uh, we, we don't know. We, we don't know, and good for them for trying something stupid. You need you need freedom <laughs> to do a lot of dumb things, and out of good dumb things come smart ones. Maybe the Twitter bird will just be that, that magenta. That'll be the difference. That's I will, there you go. I will stand up next to Brian to fight for Deutsche Telekom and Twitter's right to have the freedom to be dumb. <laughs> yeah. Nobody Absolutely. should stop them. No. Uh, nobody should stop us from firing up the randomizer, yeah. eh? Yeah. Yeah, you can't stop the signal. Uh, you know what? I'm going to be random today. Why? And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pick the one that got the most votes. <gasps> what? what? Whoa. I did that once. This is not uh -huh. a democracy, by <laughs> what the way. did they get it? Ooh, yeah. The one that got the most votes was new 3D metal printer is open source and affordable. Yeah. Go search on that, and you will find it, and it'll be awesome. But I want to talk about the tiny Kentucky town... What? That agreed to pay their police officer in Bitcoin. Town nice. of Vico, Kentucky, it's uh, south of Lexington, is actually uh, pretty progressive. They they have had passed laws enacting a ban on sexual orientation based discrimination. They only have a couple hundred people, and they just hired their first police officer who said, "Yeah, you know, I'm not very optimistic about American currency. I'd like to be paid in Bitcoin, please." They took a couple weeks to search out what the hell this Bitcoin thing was, and then they said, "All right." We'll take out your taxes and other deductions in U.S. currency, and then we'll convert it to Bitcoins and pay you that way. It's pretty brilliant. That's, yeah. that's, uh, it's, it's amazing to watch Bitcoin continue to, uh, you know, to, to, to have uh, largely positive stories like this about it. And, and, and I do think that there is a positive spin, even to the China story. Um, but, like, uh, like, it's weird. Uh, you know, on ScamStuff.com, we're now taking Bitcoin uh, and and it made like one guy extraordinarily happy, and he went out and and, and spent a bunch of stuff. So I suspect it's going to be the kind of thing for everyone where it's just going to be weird till it's not, and then all of a sudden uh, we are you know we're all taking Bitcoin, and it's not a thing at all. Like PayPal was weird until it wasn't. Yeah, that's true. PayPal was weird until it wasn't. It's not Sorry, as weird gonna... as Bitcoin. Let's be no. honest. Are you going to get paid in Bitcoin, any of you? I will. I'll take Bitcoin. Sure, as long send as it Bitcoins stays to me. Thousand. Yeah, right. As long as it keeps going up. Yeah, then anyway, yeah. that sounds like a you really good deal. You negotiate Maybe. for an equivalent amount of bitcoins. Is that how do you negotiate that? Do you say I want to well, be I paid? Well, I think what like he's probably doing is getting paid a salary, right? And then they it's just converted. convert it into yeah. bitcoins. You, so he'll get a paid a different amount of bitcoins every time. It's not like you're negotiating like fifty thousand bitcoins or whatever. Right. Would be. Um, right. That'd be weird because that would fluctuate a lot. I, I mean, it, it's just he's still getting the same salary. They're just getting creative with the method of payout. Mm -hmm. It's not really that crazy. Bitcoin. It's wacky. It is. But not. It's for policemen. It's just wacky and modern, you guys. It's for Kentuckians, apparently. Get on is that the what they're called? Kentuckiers. K Kentuckians? Oh, my God. I, just, I don't know. Can I just say right now, this is going to be a clip that, that 10 years from now we're going to look at out of context and find oh, yeah. hilarious. It'll be like oh, yeah. when, the when Good Morning video. America is trying to have the concept of the internet explained right. to them. Like, what, what's a dot com? A dot com? <laughs> you say a, this a, police an, officer an got paid. The in information green... travels via the tube. He got paid <laughs> in greenback dollars. Could you believe it? <laughs> Nobody we wants. Got, we're going to be those people. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's 2013. So when they're like in 2090, they're going to be like, wow. 
<laughs> wow. Don't worry. I'll, I'll immortalize this in the best of so that we definitely have this 10 years from now. Oh, good. Thanks. Oh. Appreciate that. <laughs> hey, you know what? We got to pay some bills, too. We're not going to pay them in Bitcoin, though. We're going to pay them by giving you something free. A Squarespace.com site. Uh, Brian Brushwood has a Squarespace.com site. I know that. You know that. I do. I got a Squarespace.com site. Uh, you can have a Squarespace.com site, too. They're constantly improving their platform. And if you get one, you could be a design idiot like me and look like a genius because they have these beautiful templates that you use. You pick a few colors. You maybe uh, upload your logo or something like that. And then, boom, you've got a fantastic website. It's incredibly easy to use. They've got an amazing support team to help you out 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Starts at just $8 a month and includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. And mobile ready. So if you're on a tablet or a phone or one of the phablets or something else, it's going to look good on all the different screen sizes. Even their code is beautiful. Start a free two-week trial with no credit card required and start building your website. You don't even need a single Bitcoin to do it. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code TNT12 to get 10% off and to show your support for Tech News Today. We thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. You guys have been great. Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. We have things on the calendar today. Yeah, you know, it's been a really quiet week, and I was like, is there ever going to be anything to talk about? Yes. Uh, Gran Turismo 6 is coming to the PlayStation 4 tomorrow, December 6th. And if you're looking ahead to uh, Valentine's Day, actually, House of Cards Season 2 is premiering February 14th, 2014. Sweet. I, for one, am thrilled. That it was is. a good Season 1. Yeah, instead of I our traditional it. Valentine's Day dinner, we should just watch House of Cards. I what better so too, way to Tom? spend... Valentine's Day it. than cuddling up with a story of sex and betrayal. That's what Valentine's Day is. <laughs> I was going to say, very fitting. Yeah. And then binging. And then you'd buy yep. a card and say right. sorry. <laughs> and make a house. Sex and betrayal. Sex. Aye, aye, All aye. right. Uh, let's see if there's an email around. Is there? Yeah, and it has nothing to do with uh, betrayal, I guess. But maybe. Uh, so <laughs> Ralph from New Jersey wrote in. He said, I got this email from Edible Arrangements today. Having fun with Amazon's announcement of drone delivery. It closes a screenshot of the email, and if you're listening to the audio only, in the ad, Edible Arrangements has a product being carried by a drone with the text saying, you can get same-day delivery, no drones required. Now, does this violate the FTC regulations because it's saying no drones, but then it shows a drone delivering the fruit basket? I'm confused as a consumer. Well, but, but this is the kind of thing that that kind of regulation leads to is somebody does a cheeky ad like this, and Wait. next thing you know, you know, it's a story and reasons brickbats about, like, you know, small business arrested. Well, it's a good thing you got a lawyer, a ex-lawyer on the panel because he says no drones required. That doesn't mean they don't have to use one. They could if they wanted to. See, the <laughs> right, ad's completely they, fine. the option open. It's not saying right. you need... Yes, there you go. <laughs> good, good. Weasel. <laughs> love it. Love the weasels. Uh, also love NSFW Show with Brian Brushwood. Uh, and I love Scam School. And, and Brian, I love you. I not oh, as Brian's much beautiful. as I love Frame Rate. That's right. Frame Rate, the show about <laughs> cutting the cord with Tom Merritt and me every Monday. Uh, any, anything going up in the in the scam stuff story you want to talk about before we let you go? Uh, no, we, we, we finished all our sales. If you want to do, you know, we, we do have some items. If you're looking for something kind of quirky to get people for uh, Christmas, uh, we we're still able to get stuff out. I think I think we're we're able to get it by Christmas by the 17th. So you got a little bit of time. But scamstuff.com, we call it gear for the modern rogue. It's all just really clever stuff. Tricky stuff like a, a, a shoelace aglet that's actually a handcuff key. So if you ever get kidnapped by robot ninjas, you can get away. An aglet's nice. a little thing at the tip of your shoelace, right? Yeah. yeah. Aglet. That's good a good word of the day. Handy. Well I like that. All right. Check it out. Thank you, Brian. Always a pleasure, mama friend. Mama friend. Mama friend. Yeah. Mama friend. Mama friend. Mama I was hoping you were going to notice that. <laughs> <laughs> but you did. <laughs> hey, open mic submissions, folks. If you want to prove you can talk better than me, you can be on the show and do it. Send an email to tnt at twit.tv. Subject line, open mic. That's M-I-C. Have to get your submission to us by next Wednesday, December 11th. And we're going to record the show Friday, December 13th at 2 p.m. Pacific for about an hour. So you have to be available at that time on that date. Uh, and obviously, I always say we're going to get more people sending us email than we can schedule. We're only going to be able to pick three. Uh, so please, apologies in advance if we don't pick you. But three of you will get picked. So, so do it. TNT at twit.tv, subject line, open mic. Tell us why we should pick you. Don't forget, you have a voice in what stories we cover. At our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. You can email us, tnt at twit.tv. You can call us, 260-TNT-SHOW. Leave us a voicemail and visit our website at twit.tv slash TNT. Tomorrow's Friday already? 
Um, that means Darren Kitchen will be on the show. We'll see you then. <laughs> I want this to be a meme. Confused, upset, teleporting Jason Howell. <laughs> he just shows up on a page. He <laughs> looks around that and was fades so away. <laughs>